Father, we enter into your gates with thanksgiving. We come into your very presence with praise. We declare you are a great and mighty God, as we declared earlier this morning. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And thank you for your love that you have demonstrated to us at the cross. Thank you for the salvation that you have provided. Thank you for the help that you give every day. Thank you for the hope that we find in you. Thank you that you're always there. Thank you, Lord, for every blessing that you bestow upon us. Even in the dark valleys of life, there's still a good God who brings us through what we're facing. Lord, we pray today that you will minister to the hearts and the lives of everyone here. We pray today that you will touch their hearts and their lives and those who are watching and those who are listening. I pray today that God, those today that are in need, they will find, oh, such a soul is such a compassionate God who will carry their burdens because Peter said, yeah, you can cast all your care upon him because he cares for you. Lord, thank you that you're that today. But Lord, I pray right now the spirit of God will just invade this place today. I pray that our eyes will be open, our hearts will be receptive, and I pray today that you will touch, Lord, and minister to hearts and lives today. If they are lost among us, God, save them. Bring old-fashioned Holy Ghost conviction. If there are those today that are having issues and difficulty in their life, just whisper into that, their spirit, peace, be still. For lo, I'm with you always, even to the very end of this earth. Thank you that you're always there. Lift up, heal, strengthen, encourage, bless, save, minister. But Lord, help us right now to focus on you. We didn't come in here today to worry about the world. We didn't come in here today to try to solve all the problems of the world. We've come in here today to praise the Lord and to seek today you for our individual lives. I pray that you will move across this waiting congregation with your spirit. Oh God, set free those who today that are in bondage. Lord, liberate those today that are hurting. Lord, help those today that need helping. Encourage those that are discouraged. And bless each one here today is my prayer. But may we today look to you. May we, this first Sunday of this new year, may we focus in on that we are going to serve God. Every waiting moment, every hour, every second of this year that we're going to focus on you and God. Lord, I believe our homecoming and homegoing is soon. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is coming soon and very soon we're going to see the King. The conditions of this world, the moral problems, the political unrest, the struggles that are in the Middle East, all these issues are looking towards one final point of that coming day when Jesus shall split the eastern sky and take his church home to be with him. Even so come, Lord Jesus, have your way in this meeting. Be glorified in our presence. Be exalted in all that we say, do, and accomplish here today. And we'll say to God be all the praise in Jesus' name. And all God's servants said, Amen. Amen. Isn't he a good God today? Give him praise. Amen. Come on, guys. I can see the waters raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear the sound of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. I can walk down this dark and painful road. I can face every fear of the unknown i can hear all god's children singing out we will not be overtaken we will not be overcome the same power that rose jesus from the grave the same power that commands the dead to wake lives in lives in us the same power that moves mountains when he speaks the same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us lives in us he lives in us lives in us we have 
Riches are true in His strength. There is nothing we can't do. Yes, we know there are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave. The same. The same power that can calm a raging sea lives in us, lives in us, he lives in us, lives in us. Greater is he that is living in me, he's conquered our enemy. No There's a Savior and He 
cause bring it all to the table There's a Savior and He calls, bring it all to the table. You are my joy, you are my song, you are the well, the one I'm drawing from, you are my
ocean. What a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all dismiss the choir right now we're going to dismiss the kids to children's verse and we're going to go back around and we're going to sing the chorus of this again so keep smiling amen they're about ready to hit it for us and we're going to start right about now y'all sing and smile today leaning leaning safe and secure from all the Just one more time, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. hillside darkness covered the land Jesus hung bleeding and dying for the lost souls of man he could have called ten thousand angels Take him away from that shame. I am so grateful his grace reached to me the day that loved called my name. When Jesus died, what sacrifice, what love and compassion was shown. When he stretched out his hands and said, I love you this much, such mercy has never been known. And when he cried, it's finished. Everything changed. I will never forget. Love beyond measure 
the Savior has for me. Why can't understand why he cares so much that he would die upon that old tree? He took my sin and all I had been and made my life over anew. There at the cross, his love called to me. Now that same love is calling to you. You ask me what love is. It's a man hanging on a tree. You ask me what mercy is. It's that man dying instead of me. When Jesus died, what sacrifice, what love and compassion was shown. When he stretched out his hands and said, I love you this much, such mercy has never been known. And when he cried, it's finished. to the book of Matthew chapter 7 verses 7 through 11 and we're talking today about our good father now don't be just don't let the title today uh, throw you for a loop because we're dealing with what Jesus talked about asking seeking and knocking and I think it's very important it's very in, it's very important and very pertinent that on this first Sunday of this new year you know, you typically think, well, they're going to deal with, you know, getting your spiritual life right. You know, you've already dealt with the issue about reading the Bible. But an important part of your spiritual life is your prayer life. And I contend that Christians are not praying as they should. Christians and churches are not praying as they should. And uh, I'm not here to beat you up this morning. I'm here to encourage you in the Word of God with the Scriptures of how we can involve several things in our lives that will sharpen our skills in our prayer life and realize that prayer should be an important part of our, our living, our walk with God, and how we're serving Him. So today, can you imagine praying for one year for a specific thing, but not just not that one year, but praying for this one specific thing for 70 approximately years, approximately seven years. You've been praying about this one thing. I mean, we pray one day and it hasn't happened. We get all anxious and out of sorts. Or if it hasn't happened within a week, we really get stressed out. And if it happens, hasn't happened in two weeks, we really get frustrated. Well, can you imagine praying for 70 years, the prayer that you had and it wasn't answered? And you're talking about persistence, and you're talking about faith, that's exactly what happened here. There was persistence and faith in what happened with Zechariah and Elizabeth. Most theologians agree that Zechariah and Elizabeth were somewhere in their 90s that when Luke chapter 1 takes place. You say, Preacher, I thought we was in Matthew 7. We are, but just hang tight. We'll get there in a moment. We just got to go a little bit of a path to get there so you can understand the importance of prayer. They'd been asking God, and I believe that had been a persistent asking. And that persistence in asking also was coupled with a persistence in trust and faith. So they'd been doing this for asking for a child for 60 or 70 years, and God came back without a yes. It seemed like that God just wasn't giving this issue any attention with Zechariah and Elizabeth. And they could have done what many people do is give up on God and give up and quit. And so many times that's what happens in our spiritual life. 
That's what happens in our walk with God. We give up on God. We pray a prayer. We say something that's on our heart. We want something done. And we get anxious and we get excited and we want it done yesterday, which is typical because we have zero patience. But listen, I'm not going to encourage you to pray for patience. I'm going to encourage you to pray for grace. Amen. But realizing that they had prayed and prayed, but this persistence in faith, you know, it's so easy to give up when things are not going your way. It's so easy to give up when things are not happening in the timetable that you want them to happen. We live in a hurry-up world today. We get frustrated when we go through drive-in uh, driveways or drive these fast food restaurants, and the food is not waiting at the window when we get there. We get frustrated when things are not occurring quickly. We get frustrated with our computers because we hit the button and it took two seconds instead of one second to get you to that website. We get aggravated because our phones don't work fast enough or somebody doesn't answer quick enough. We live in a hurry up and get it done world and we think God should be the same way that when I call, he should answer me immediately. But understand, when Jeremiah said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things, it didn't mean it was gonna happen at that very moment. You've got to have persistence and you've got to have faith in God. So Zechariah, the priest, could have said, why well, serve God? I've been praying for 60, 70 years and this thing has not happened and has not occurred. What good does it do today to be holy and righteous if God then doesn't answer your prayer? That could have been the thought that he could have entertained in his life. What good is it today in living for him anyway? And I've had people actually pose that question to me. Well, I prayed and I've tried. The problem is you're trying, but you're not serving. And there's a difference. You're trying to manipulate God to do what you want God to do when you want God to do it. You're trying to get God to move in your timetable and your ways and provide what you want in life. But folks, that's not the way God works. And if that's your idea today of God, you've got the wrong idea. You've got to get in a position today of trusting God in all things today and praying and realize today it's not a question today of God, his righteousness, his good, and his ability. Because I'm glad today the word of God declares today that our God can move in mighty ways. And he can do the impossible. Amen. So what really you think about it, and I've had people say, well, Pastor, I'm trying to serve God, but he's not answering my prayers and things are not working. Why should I even serve him anyway? You don't serve him because you get from God. You serve him because you love him. You serve him because of what he's done for you. You serve him today because he's a good God. So here's the problem today with so many of us. Too many of us want God on our own terms. We want God to move in the ways that we want God to move. We want God to do when we tell God to do it. Folks, it's easy to serve God when he gives us what we want. But what happens when God doesn't give you what you want? What happens when God doesn't say yes? What happens when God says no? What happens when God says wait? What do you do in those places of time? In the condition of the world in which we're living today. Have you ever prayed? And when it seems like... Like heaven is covered with steel curtains. It's like you beat on the door but nobody answers. It's like you tried and you tried and you tried to get a hold of God, but he has not responded to that need in your life. Have you been praying and seemingly your prayers have been responding to by God with silence? He hasn't answered. Do you ever pray? And you feel like, man, all I'm doing is just talking to myself. I'm expending a lot of energy and a lot of time and I'm praying, but nothing's happening. Can you imagine what it was like on this earth when God didn't speak to humanity for 400 years? And we get excited when he hasn't spoken to us in four minutes or 40 seconds. You got to get this straight today. God does hear our prayers. You've got to get this straight too. God does answer our prayers today. Amen. So from Luke chapter 1, verse 37, today, I like the way it's placed here. In their situation, because it all boils down to this, and this is what you've got to remember in your prayer life today, nothing is impossible with God. We try to manipulate and we try to do and we try to get and we try to get everything worked out in our lives. 
We spend a lot of time and we just think, I'm so frustrated, I'm so aggravated. If I could throw you my phone right now and you start reading some of the texts that I've get and I've gotten of people that are going through frustrating times and they're ready to give up on God and don't know what to do. Folks, let me tell you right now, my response to you is simply this, nothing is impossible with God, amen. The same God that heard the prayer of Zechariah and Elizabeth Here's your prayers today also. And I'm glad today, friend, listen, we've got to have today the attitude that today we'll submit ourselves in prayer for God to do that very thing and for us to realize nothing is impossible with God. Let's face it. We all have deficits in our prayer life, don't we? We may think, man, I can just pray and everything moves. Oh, really? I don't think so. It doesn't work that way. My purpose today is to encourage you, not to beat you up. Your prayer life is how you approach God in your request. It's very important that you've got to have the right attitude towards God. It's very important today that you've got to have a right attitude concerning the Word of God. It's very important today that you've got to condition yourself today to get in a position of belief and believing that God knows what's best and God will move appropriately in the timing that is necessary. So today, you've got to put your faith in God. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word in reverence of His Word, if you're able today. And it's a very short scripture reading today from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, picking up with 7 down through 11. And these today are scriptures that maybe we even know, have memorized, and are familiar with. I'm sure you're familiar with this. It's plastered all over the front of your bulletin today. It was on Facebook last night to remind you about what we were going to be dealing with today. And we realize this is a pertinent part of our Christian life. So the word of God says, and the first word that it says is ask. <laughs> Asking it shall be given you. That's not speculation, that's fact. That's not a cross your finger or hope so mentality. This is a known fact. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. For everyone that asketh receiveth. Did you hear what I just said? For everyone that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh does what? Findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if the son ask bread, he give him a stone? <laughs> if ye then be evil, he says being evil, know how to give good gifts he says unto your children, how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give you good things to them that ask? I mean, you think about what God's saying here. You see what God's trying to imply here. You may be seated. We just come out of a season that we've celebrated called Christmas. That season is inundated with gifts and giving. You know, you shop until you drop. You go out and you... You buy and you buy and you buy, and there you got to pay off, pay off, pay off what you bought. And I'm sure some of you planned strategically in your gift giving. Some of you didn't. You went to Walmart and you bought them junk and wrapped it up and thought you was giving them something. Hey, yeah. Giving good gifts, we're not going to talk about that, that's best past, that's history. Giving good gifts takes quite a bit of work, doesn't it? It takes effort, it takes care. You want to give something to someone that is meaningful, something that they will enjoy, something that they will get blessed by. And I'm glad to remind you today that our good God gave the greatest gift by giving his son, Jesus Christ. So you just can't walk away. Here it is, the 25th has passed, it's gone now, and here we are in the new year, and so forget about Christmas. How can you forget about what God did at Christmas? How can you forget about he becoming flesh? How can you forget about God incarnate? How can you forget about the plan that God announced in Genesis 3.15 and what he would do? From the very breath today that you breathe today through the protection that he provides and gives you each day along with supplying your every need according to his riches and glory as Paul describes in Philippians 4.19 we can agree today that God is constantly on the giving end. We're constantly getting from God. You say, well, he isn't giving me anything today. Well, you're breathing, aren't you? It lets you arise to see a new day. Hallelujah. You might have some pains in your body, but let me tell you what. You're still breathing. 
God has watched over you. God's supplying your need. God today is giving you today the opportunity to come hear the word, to hear the music, and to be in the fellowship of believers today and to enjoy the presence of God. That's a blessing and that's a gift from God. But you realize sometimes in those hard places of life, and some of you have been there, some of you are still there, and you're going through turns of difficulty in your life and challenges in hard times, whether it be in your health or whether it's in your relationships or whatever the challenges. I mean, we could go from A to Z and cover all these things, but today that's not what we're focusing on. It's just the reality today that we face issues and trials and circumstances in our life. And sometimes we call out to God and God hasn't answered yet and we understand and we start questioning God as to why he's not moving. Then we start taking inventories of what's wrong in my life. Why am I not getting from God? What is, why isn't he moving? Why isn't he doing something in my life? It's not the place to start asking why. It's a, start, it's a place where you start saying, God, in all things I'll still trust you. I mean, look what Job went through. Job lost 10 children. God, he, God just basically let the devil wreak havoc in his life. But here's the difference of what Job's life is and ours is today. God could trust Job to give honor and glory and praise to him. God could trust Job today that even though he said, even though he slay me, yet will I still praise him. And even in the valleys that you go through in the dark places, you still say that my God is still a good God, amen. amen. And even when I'm going through, I know I'll get through. And even when I'm down, I know who brings me up. Even when I'm out, I know who's there for me. Even in the valley of trials that we face, we know that our God is a present help in time of trouble, Psalm 46. Because that's who he is. He's a good God. And folks, sometimes in those moments, if we're not careful, we get, then get into a position of doubt. We begin starting to question whether God is a good giver or not. And we start talking about, well, I don't know why God hasn't helped me. He helped someone else. Let me tell you, I want to promise you right now, God is going to help you get through what you're going through. But you've got to demonstrate today faith and trust and persistence in your life today with God. From Matthew 7, Jesus wants us to know how good our Heavenly Father is. That's why I chose the title that I did today for that message. Jesus wants you to know God gives good gifts. Amen. And your Heavenly Father wants to today, He wants to answer you and He wants to bestow upon you those good gifts. So our theme, we come down to a theme today as we try to give you one each Sunday, and simply this, a very simplistic theme today, we can ask and trust our good God because he gives good gifts. Amen. He does. Well, if I've got so much going on in my life, it's not so good. How in the world can you stand up there and tell me God's a good God? Your focus is skewed. Your focus has been pulled away. Because what happens if we're not careful? Our attention can be drawn on us rather than on God. The word give, giver, the word giver, or the word gifts, is woven throughout the passages there in chapter 7 of the book of Matthew. For it declares this. You can start at the first verse and go to the last verse, and what you will find is God is a giving God. The problem is what we want from God sometimes doesn't match the will of God. And therefore, then we get an attitude towards God. In order for our God to be a good giving God, we also find today that our God is a good God who gives good gifts to his children. But first, you've got to be a child of God in order for God to give you the good gifts. The greatest gift that God's ever given you is what is called salvation. And the fact that you saw yourself lost, undone without Christ, and you called upon him and received him into your heart and your life. Listen, how we pray to him is really affected by how today we see our God. How do you see God today in your life? You only see God as your sugar daddy just giving you good stuff, and all you want is God, give me, give me, give me, but my name's not Jimmy. I'm not trying to be poetic. But we just want God to give, give, give. 
But we're not willing to give of ourselves unto the Lord. We don't grasp the idea today that we, in order for him to abide with us, we've got to abide with him. In order for us to receive from him today, you've got to be serving him. Let me tell you what, he's just not a God that sits in heaven and says, oh, I'm senile, whoever wants whatever, here you go. That's not the way it works. God respects those who serve him today. God honors those today. You say, well, I haven't received any things. Does that mean I'm not honoring God? No, because sometimes God can has to trust you to go through what you're going through to bless you greater in the way that he's going to do it at the appropriate time that he's already designed for that to happen. So you can't give up on God. Our prayer life is affected today by how we see God. I have several ways in which we should pray. Very simple. One, we pray with helplessness. What? We pray with helplessness. When we pray, we're declaring God is able and we're not. Right. When you pray, you're declaring that God is an able God and that we're not able. So when we come to him, we are acknowledging today that we can't, but God can. The word of God declares of God that he can do all things. The word of God declares of God that there is nothing too hard for God. Read Jeremiah 32, 17. Hey, Lord God, there's nothing too hard for thee. Oh, yeah, preacher, I've heard all the scriptures. Yeah, I've heard all the rhetoric. I've heard all the dialogue. But let me tell you today, it's more than rhetoric and dialogue. It's God. Because God is his word, and God will do what his word says he will do. Amen. Give him some praise. Amen. So when we come to him, we're acknowledging today that we can't, but God can. And I've seen God do this in my life, my family, in your lives, in this church, and many other lives today. The first way Jesus tells us to approach him is simply a three-letter word spelled A-S-K, ask. Ask. <laughs> ask. When you ask, it's typical that when we have run out of resources to do what is needed, then we do what? So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying today, you, too many of you are making God your last chance instead of your first choice. Amen. We like to think that we can do anything on our own. Well, I've got all these connections and people, and I know this, and I know that. I've got money. I've got prestige. I've got all this. You don't have nothing. You don't have nothing. And you can't do anything. You know, you can't do anything on your own anyway. You can't even breathe unless he lets you breathe. You can't walk unless he today will move your hands, your brain, and get everything. Isn't it amazing this human body had all works the way it works? We have to realize that when we are asking for help, we today then become dependent on something or someone to help us today. You ever called on somebody, you need a little help or something? You didn't know quite what to do or how to do it, and you called on somebody? Some of y'all use uh, YouTube. That's your helpline. You don't know how to do this, so you look on, see how to do that. And sometimes that works. Sometimes it don't work. But I'm going to tell you, there's a God who always works. Amen. Jesus addressed this very issue in John 15 and verse 5 when he says, Without me, you can't do anything. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Without him, you can't do anything. But then Paul jumps up and says, Wait a minute. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Yeah. See, it's an attitude. It's a trust. It's a reliance. It's a confidence. It's God and not you. Right. It's simply what you're doing. You're submitting yourself to the leadership of God to work in your life. And this is only possible when Jesus, as Jesus says, here's where it really the rubber hits the road. It's the fact today that he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Well, if you know anything about horticulture, you know that the branches cannot exist without the vine. You know that the branch gets its nourishment from the vine. So therefore today, he uses this reference to horticulture, to plants, and talks about he's the vine, he's the source, he is our help. He is our hope, and everything that he says in his word as the vine comes through him, but we've got to be the branches. So first thing you've got to do, you've got to get into relationship with him. You've got to know him as your personal savior. You've got to receive him. You must be born again. 
as Jesus told Nicodemus. Listen, you're never going to be today a branch until you come to God broken, spilled out, and realizing that you're lost and Jesus will take you. And you know what's so amazing about this? He grafts you into that vine. And what else is amazing about this? He makes you a family member. You become an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus because you have received the Lord into your heart and your life and you know him as your personal savior today. Many times, you know, very often, we don't seek the Lord. We don't ask for his help today. And it's because of our own sin and our pride today that gets in the way. We don't want to ask. I'm not asking nobody. I'm not calling on God. Oh, really? Well, I called on him and he didn't hear me and didn't answer me. Oh, he heard you. The problem is that you haven't got into dependence on God. You haven't come to the yourself and realized that you can't do anything and he can do everything. Yeah, that means you've got to take your pride and your sin and crucify it. That means you've got to lay you down and you've got to take up Jesus. Come on, church. So many times when we don't pray, it's because of our sinful hearts. Our hearts then separate us. Sin separates you from God. God's not going to bless you just because you are who you are or your lineage or anything else about you. For we're, we're saying this, God, and what you're actually are coming down to the point of saying is, God, I just don't need you in this moment. You need him every moment. You need him every hour of the day. You need him every day. So this is why he tells us we need to ask. You must ask. So we need to come to God and we need to come to God asking for help today. And when you don't ask for help, you think that you don't need God. I'm here to tell you today and to rebuke you and tell you, you do need God. Amen. Remember this passage about, this passage is about a good God that gives and we need God's good gifts. Amen. Amen. Also, don't forget this. The day you were saved, you came to God saying you were helpless and in need of help in salvation. Because you can't get to heaven on your own. You cannot get into the pearly gates of heaven by anything about you. Because everything about you is a negative. Don't get personal, uh, offend, personally offended at that. But listen today. We all, what's the word say? Fall short of the glory of God. We all, what's the other word? Miss the mark. So we all are at a deficit. We have no way to pay this bill. I'm glad he paid the bill. And I'm glad when you come to him, the bill has already been paid. I'm glad that when you come to him, he receives you. When you come to him, he takes everything that was against you, everything that was wrong in your life, all the sin, and casts it away from you and makes you a child of God. Amen. Amen. That's what our God does. See, you can't spiritually resurrect yourself from being spiritually dead. So today, it's not religion, it's not denominations, it's not people, it's not priests, it's not rabbis, it's not preachers, it's not any of that. Today, it's not the song book, it's not the piano, it's not the pulpit, it's Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Salvation is a declaration of your helplessness. And if you're saved today, you came to God and said, I'm helpless and I need your help. Scripture says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. After salvation, we still come to God. See, it doesn't stop at salvation. It begins at salvation. And we come to God because in all the other issues of life, we are still helpless today. You can't solve your problems and you need God's help. You don't have the answers. I don't care how many schools you've gone to, how many degrees you have and how smart you are. You still have not got all the answers to life. And you need God's help. When you ask, you're declaring you need God in your life. I'm telling you today, you, me, and everyone else today, we need God in our lives today. Amen. David declared in Psalm 121, I looked unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Right. Amen. Let's be honest today. In your prayer life, how much do you ask God for? Well, I ask him just to get me by, preacher. Oh, so you just got to get by God, huh? I just asked him to help me with this little thing, and I don't worry about the rest. Oh, really? Listen, do you see yourself as helpless? Huh. Do you see yourself today 
Maybe you see yourself as having it all together. I'll get all this worked out. No, you won't. You didn't get it worked out in 19. How are you going to get it worked out in 20? Because you haven't worked it out yet. What makes you think you're going to work it out without God's help? God wants you to come to him and he wants you to ask him for what? Everything. Amen. I'm here to tell you today, you've got to have a fundamental dependence upon the Lord. Second point, we pray to seek his will. When we pray, we're seeking what God desires and not what we desire. Because what we desire is lesser than that. Well, Isaiah dealt with that. Isaiah 55, he said, God's ways are higher than the heavens. So if God's ways are higher than the heavens, what's our ways? Lower than the earth. So today, why are you living substandard to what God wants you to live today? Well, I thought life is getting by. I mean, is that the mentality of the world today? That might be the mentality of the lost world, but it's not the mentality of the saved world. God wants to abundantly bless you today, church. He wants to bless your family, your life, and everything about you today. Jesus says, seek and ye shall what? F-I-N-D. Smells fine. Stepping back into Matthew a moment. Go back to Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto who? You. Amen. Amen. Seek ye first. See, God's a part-time, sometime, anytime God in a lot of your lives today. You're not crowning him Lord. You throw him a little token of your time on Sunday, and that's it. You don't pray, you don't read your Bible, but you think, I'll be all right. No, you're not. God's looking for people who will abide. And when you start seeking the Lord, he's looking at your life and seeing if you're seeking him. Seek the Lord while he may be found, the word of God says. The good gifts will come when your heart and your desires today align with the kingdom of God and his desires for you. You've got to start putting Jesus first. Instead of just having a part-time, sometime, anytime God and just serving him when it's convenient and comfortable and when you feel like it, let me tell you what, you're totally missing the boat. The boat has left the dock. You need today to start seeking God in your life every day. Amen, pastor. Thank you, preacher. I appreciate that one amen. Our problem is what happens, we're seeking other things. We're seeking worldly things. We're seeking financial profit. We're looking for flesh motivators. We're looking for what makes us feel good in this encasement that we have around our bones called flesh. And we're so carnal today, we can't even see straight. It's only when your prayers align with the desires of God that God is going to answer. So it's no time for you to get an attitude with God. It's time for you today to start getting in the will of God and start doing as God desires in your life. Yes. Amen, preacher. Thank you. Some of you are struggling with this issue today. Amen. I texted someone yesterday. I said, I, I want to see you in church tomorrow. You know what? They didn't even answer my verse. I mean, gee whiz, you can just write back and say, thank you, preacher, or something. Hello. You can run from me all you want to. You know what? You can run all you want to. But you can't run from God and get by with it. God will get your attention. I promise you that. And I'm not speaking evil or bad on you today. I'm telling you, you keep messing around with God, he's going to jerk your chain. And I'm telling you right now, when he jerks, you never get over it. You still have the reactions from it that go with you. Amen. I don't mean you have a twitch all the time. But I mean, you're going you're to know God's been trying to get your attention. So what does, what does God not answer yes to in my prayers, you may be asking. Well, I'll tell you why he doesn't answer our prayers. It's because we are a fallen, sinful people and we are not asking God for his blessings and we're not aligning with God's will. You'd better be glad that God does not say yes to everything. Amen. I've heard people say, I pray God will give me a new whatever. But you didn't pray about how you're going to pay for it. And then all of a sudden, yikes, you can't meet your bills. We need to learn to see things through the will of God. For your desires and his desires 
must match in order for God to answer your prayers. Our prayers are off because our sinful desires are on. Hello? Yeah. So a prayer life is one that God is molding you today around what he desires to have happen in your life. And yes, sometimes you got to go through stuff to get to the blessing that he's got for you. It's not a snap your finger or slap your table or shout out and think, God, now don't start crying crocodile tears. And say, I'll just act like I'm all broken up and sad. I just can't stop crying. God, but that's me. No, we won't. He's going to say, get over your temper tantrum. Stop making a spectacle of yourself. <laughs> I think God sometimes just stands up from the throne and looks down at us and says, here's one of my little catchy phrases. Oh, really? Mm. Preacher, I thought this message was going to be encouraging. I told you that it was going to be, and if you'll do what it says, it will be. <laughs> oh, yeah. See, God sees more. He is ultimately the wise one today, and it's time we start seeking him. Number three, and I, I told you I'm going to get you out of here somewhere on time. So you say, well, man, how many more points are there? I don't know. We pray with perseverance. Now, I usually don't know have a 10-point message. If we do, you better come and bring your lunch and your dinner and your breakfast for the next day. Amen. We pray with perseverance. Amen. Listen, brother, we are not one and done in prayers. It's just not praying one time and thinking, oh, that's it. I got it. You've got to knock. And you know what? If you're knocking, somebody said, well, I went to their house and I knocked, but nobody would come to the door. Well, how'd you knock? One knock, don't do it. If I come to your house, I'm going to get your attention. I'm not going to go. Unless I don't want you to come to the door. I'm going to ring your doorbell. I'm going to bang on your windows and doors. <laughs> and you're going to probably call the cops. <laughs> Some guy out here trying to get in my house. No, I use that. Listen, you got to knock and keep on knocking, friend. Praying has to be persevering. You've got to persevere. You've got to keep, keep. I got knocked down. God will get you back up. I called out and he has an answer. Call out again. He still has an answer. Call out again. Amen. God expects you today to continue to bring things in seeking him. Now there's several reasons for persistent prayer. And I got a couple bullets for you here. Not to shoot yourself with, but bullets that will help you. This helps remind us that God is the one who provides the answer. Amen. You, you need to be reminded who is the one who is the provision and the provider for your life. What did David say? <laughs> I once was young, now I'm old. Haven't seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. Persistent prayer is dependent prayer. And so persistent prayer is dependent prayer. And so persistent prayer is dependent prayer. So persistent prayer is dependent, dependent prayer. So when you get to this place in your prayer life, you will then learn to give him the praise. Hallelujah. Amen. See, some of you haven't gotten to that yet. All you want is give me God, give me, give me, give me. But you never grunt back. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Persistence in prayer is to teach us today. Continual prayer helps us today to really to get to know the Lord. Because your prayer is your communication. And the more you talk to God, the more that you know who he is. Amen. Point number four. That was a quick one. We pray with expectation. It's only two more. This one and one more. Matthew 7 and 8 is God's promise. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and him that seeketh it shall, be, uh, shall findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened unto him. So why is it that God does not always answer our prayer? God does not give a yes in everything, and he won't. Amen. So it's only when we, when we, and the request are in sync with God's will that God says yes. And it's in God's timing. So God, let me tell you what, God's not your genie in a bottle. 
Amen. God gives a promise that you are in his will and you seek him. There will be gifts and God will give those gifts to those who seek him and who knock. Also, you've got you must believe you cannot pray and believe or you cannot pray and receive if you're not believing. You've got to believe every word of God, every word. God's gifts are given to those who pray. God's gifts are given to those who believe. God's gifts are given to those who are right with God. So God uses your prayer to guide you to the right answer. So if something's wrong in your life, let me tell you what prayer does. It reveals what's wrong. And God then gives you the grace to get that wrong right with him, through him. So when you doubt, you know what you're doing? You're really thinking that God is not really that good. You have a doubt in your prayer life? You don't have to answer that one. Do you have a doubt in God in your prayer life? I don't know why you haven't answered me. If you don't believe that people do that, read the Psalms. Read some of the writings of David. David, the man after God's own heart? Really? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. He doubted God, but he didn't stay in doubt. He got out of it. Point five. We pray with trust. If you're struggling in your prayer life, friends, listen. If you're not careful, you can think God then is cruel and doesn't care for you. And then you withdraw yourself from his presence. Jesus addressed this very issue in that text. He says, if your children come to you hungry, you don't give your children a stone and a snake. Amen. No parent would do that. I would surely hope not. I don't know, in this culture we're living in today, I'm not surprised at anything we hear anymore. Jesus said you give them bread and a fish. Right? But what about us when we pray and we pray and we pray and we keep on praying and we keep on praying and seemingly God gives you nothing but difficulty. You pray and you say, I know it's going to get better. And what did it do? It got worse. Dealing with realities here, folks. No pie in the sky here. Reality is what we live. See, we have flaws, but God doesn't. And even though that God permitted things to happen in our life, then as you got to do what I told someone to do this morning that texted me, I said, listen, you've got to stop looking to you and start looking to him. You've got to start doing what the word of God says in Romans 8 and 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Who are they called according to his purpose? Purpose. But I'm going through difficulty. There's a purpose in that difficulty. But let me tell you what. When you get on the other side of that difficulty. You will understand why you went through. And the blessing will be greater. And God will be more radiant in your life than he's ever been. Because it's in those places. I hate to tell you this. But it's the truth. Those places are a place where you grow. See your difficulties are either going to destroy you or develop you. And it's all dependent upon you what you let it do. If you let it beat you down to the ground, and that's it. That's exactly what it's going to do. But I'm glad today there's a God that comes along. I'm glad when we cry out, when we ask, we seek, we knock. When we cry out to God in faith, believing today, I'm glad the heavens will open. And God will show up. There is a Jesus who's on the scene to do the impossible today. Church, don't give up praying. Don't give up believing. Don't give up trusting. Today our Heavenly Father gives you and desires good things in your benefit today. If anybody told you that God is mean, cruel, and hard, you tell them that they are a liar because our God is a good and awesome God. How many things has God brought you through? How many of you today just simply by throwing up a hand or two today would say, God's brought me through something preacher. Amen. Those good things today. Those good things are to do what? Not to make you go, woo, wow, we. You can do that too if you want to. It's to get you to the place that you glorify God. Amen. Don't stop praying. Don't let the dark sins of this world today take away your view of God, of who he is. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. 
And I encourage you today, let this year, 2020, can you believe it? 2020, be a year of prayer for you. For you, your family, for your church, and for your community, and for your nation. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person does what? It avails much. As our nation will get turned back to God, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will hear their cry, their plea, their call. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. The, you said that's for the nation? No, that's for you too. If we will do that, God will answer. Would you bear your heads for a moment? Are there needs residing in your life today? Are you saved? Are you sure of that? If you're not saved today, just I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to tell you, you've heard the word. If you're not saved, you need to be saved. And I just need you to acknowledge that you need Jesus in your heart and your life. And you need, you need to be born again. Anybody in that situation today? Just slip your hand up. Say, pray for me. Preach, I need to be saved. If you're not, I pray you will. And you come to Jesus as a sinner and say, forgive me my sin. Two, last week, two folks came to the Lord Jesus Christ. And prayed that same sinner's prayer. Saw themselves as a sinner. Saw Jesus dying for them. And then they asked him to forgive. And he did. But how about your prayer life today? How about your life in general? How about your home? Your family? How about the prayer needs that are in your life today? How many simply by throwing your hand up again and say, There are prayer needs that reside in my life and in my family today. I need today for people to pray for me. Pray for me. Please throw your hand up. All over the church. Pray, pray, pray. I need prayer. Come on, y'all. You need it. If you didn't raise your hand, you still need it. Father, we thank you today for your mighty presence. As we stand to our feet today, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you that, Lord, we can pray and call upon a God who hears because you are a hallowed God. You one that deserves praise because you're worthy. I pray today you'll deal with our hearts. And Lord, we just won't raise hands and say, yeah, there's needs in my home, my life, my family, our nation, our community. I'm going to come and pray. Oh, God, move. Oh, God, move first in me. Move in my life. Show me, touch me, convict me, bring me to the place that I'm helpless and I realize I need you. Would you pour out your grace upon us today, Lord? As folks are stepping out of pews into aisles and down to altars, I pray, Lord, now in Jesus' name that we will step forward, come to altars in prayer, believing and trusting today in Jesus' name. Would you come?